<laughs> Jailbreak by Steve Moran. Stupid. Pure stupid I was. I don't even want to talk about it. Oh Lord Jesus forgive me for all the effing and blinding I did to that shower of miserable bitches. I rue the day I ever agreed to have them. I knew. I knew. It was against my better judgment. Take my advice. If you're inside and you only have a month to go, don't even talk to anyone. Just keep yourself to yourself. But you see, that's my problem. Mouth almighty. But how was I to know that the weight of the laundry bundle with them inside would overbalance me into the chute? Holy mother of God, I nearly broke every bone in their bodies when I landed on top of them. And you think I could get back up the chute? The two of them and my own arms combined couldn't even get me an inch off the ground. The way it was, they had nothing to lose. Melanie the nurse had killed about ten elderly patients, just out of kindness really. <laughs> Say what you like, but she'd give you her last fag. And Sadie from the Sudan had machine gunned dozens of passengers queuing for Ryanair, then turned on the police, and one way or another was on 15 consecutive life sentences. Terrible nice girl she was, though, when you got to know her. <laughs> the laundry van driver was in on it. He let us out in Finsbury Park. But he wasn't best pleased to find me and Melanie in there. It was only Zadie he was expecting. So Melanie and me said, cheerio, and wandered off down Hornsey Road, with the brassers giving us dirty looks, as if they thought we were trying to muscle in on their territory. It was starting to get dark, and with no money. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm going back to jail, says I. You better get out of this area. I turned around and wasn't I talking to myself? Melanie was over at the curb with her head in a car. Meanwhile, a couple of ugly looking tarts at the far corner let a yelp out of them and started hobbling towards us on their high heels. Get in, Carmen, says Melanie. He wants the both of us. She gets in the back of the Mondeo, leaving muggins with Mrs. Mr. Travelling Salesman in the front. I know, I know. I'm a fool to myself. If there's one thing I hate, it's people who think of an idea and then expect somebody else to do it. But Fatty always gets offered the front seat, of course, so that was her excuse. This geezer. I swear he was worse than myself. He had a boring pair of shoes stuck in the passenger footwell. Don't even start me on the stuff crowding the passenger side. And he was driving in slippers. His ankles were as swelled up as his double chin. And I'm thinking to myself, this old shite hawk wants the two of us. When his hand starts moving like the beast with five fingers over me thigh. I hit it so hard, I swear I hurt myself through it. And the car starts swerving all over the road and your man roaring. I couldn't describe the sound he made. It was one of those with no words in it, if you know what I mean. Other cars were hooting their horns and we went through a red light. Would you believe all this time? Melanie is in the back seat, sucking her lips and fixing her face in the rear view mirror, leaning this way and that, as if nearly getting smashed to bits was only a minor nuisance. Then she puts her lipstick away and wraps her arm around the driver. It was pathetic, really, the way his expression brightened for a split second before she produced a feckin' flick knife out of somewhere and put it against what passed for his neck. Hit the in for west, was all she said. Your man starts blustering about something 
trying to reason with her. Don't try your sales talk on me, darling, she says. I've killed 11 people already, so another one is not going to make much difference. <laughs> 11, says I. I thought it was 10. Mm. Sorry, 10, you're right. I was getting ahead of myself. The <laughs> car <laughs> starts swerving all over the road again. And hasn't your man gone purple? We're slowing down. The geezer has passed out. So I yank the handbrake and we stop abruptly. More horns honking. Shit, says Melanie. I knew this guy was a loser the minute you saw him. The geezer's mobile phone started ringing, playing the feckin' 1812 overture. Can you shut that thing up? I can't hear, can't hear myself think. Melanie was all for putting him in the boot and driving the car to some friends of hers in Wales. She was typing something on your man's mobile, replying to the missed call from the geezer's wife, it looked like. Aunt in Wales has kicked the bucket. You don't know her. Family in a mess. Got a call to go there quick. She clicked send and then turned off the phone. I says, ah, jeez, this is not for me. I see you around. Hang on, where are you going? Says she. I didn't answer. I thought about walking, but there was nothing on this road either way. It was just fences and grass on one side and a sheer drop on the other side down to more feckin' fields. So, I thought I'd get a bit away from the car and start hitchhiking. <laughs> One minute. That's all it took before I was climbing into the driver's car of a humongous juggernaut and Melanie standing in the door of the geezer's car giving me a look of disgust and anger. <laughs> now, when I say climbing into it, I mean I tried but I couldn't swing the old booty up there because it was very high. Then it doesn't Eddie Stobart, or whoever he is, jump out and whoosh me up by the bum. Well, I felt like feckin' Darcy Boss when I was at night. <laughs> My old next door neighbour, when I was a kid, was always telling me I should do ballet. He would have loved to see me on your man's hands, sailing up through the air. Not that he could have, though. Unfortunately, he was blind. It wasn't my day. Because the next thing, it turns out that Eddie is a big fan of country music. And his truck stereo, it's putting years on me by the minute. So I thought I'd try and get him talking, but of course, he'd only shout over it. I'm travelling light, says I. So I say. He shouts. Meanwhile, the radio is playing something like, I don't want your nasty kisses and don't tell me no more lies. <laughs> I shout, I fell out with my friend in the car back there. The radio goes, get your tongue out of my mouth. I'm kissing you goodbye. You'll get your duffer cold out at night in a little dress like that, says your man. I can't hear you! He turns it down, thanks be to Christ. How far do you uh, want to go? Says he. I could sense the drift in the conversation. <laughs> Just drop me as near the next railway station as you can, thanks, Eddie. Oh, do you think that's my name? <laughs> he laughs. It is, yeah, of course it is. You're Irish, ain't you? What can I call you? Anything, as long as you don't call me too early in the morning. <laughs> I think I'll call you Rosaline. Oh, my dark Rosaline, do not sigh, 
do not weep. I'm parking up for the night soon at a travel lodge. Do you want to stop over? Now, strange as it may seem, I had nowhere to stay and no idea what I was going to do. So this didn't sound so terrible to me. Plus, Eddie was sort of Bruce Springsteen shaped, albeit with a face more like Bruce for sight. <laughs> you can always go back to the Nick in the morning. So, anyway, we ate in the bar restaurant attached to the travel lodge. I had smothered chicken and he had pulled pork. <laughs> When we got to the room, he wanted to reenact Fifty Seven Shades of Grey and made me blindfold him and tie him to the bed. And God forgive me, I know I'm evil. But I took his wallet and left him there like a pressed up and mini-cabbed it back to HMP Holloway. <laughs>